Howdy folks and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. This is Mauka Dragon in the Japanese Tier 10 gunboat destroyer, the Harugamo. On the Atlantic map, it's a Tier 10 battle, obviously he's in a Tier 10 destroyer, but there are some Tier 8s in this match, including the two aircraft carriers. Mauka Dragon's team have an Implacable, the enemy team have a Lexington. The enemy team only have the one radar, which is good. Unfortunately, that's one more radar than his team have. Still, that's actually pretty good matchmaking for a Tier 10 gunboat destroyer. It could easily be a lot worse. Just take a look at this, for example. Somebody sent this in the other day. No aircraft carriers. At the same time, though, when you are in a destroyer, you really don't want to see seven cruisers on the enemy team, especially not when six of them have radar, and only three of the cruisers on your team do. So, yeah, could definitely have been a lot worse. So, the Harugamo, what do you need to know? Well, just in case you didn't already know, it's completely unlike most other Japanese destroyers, with the exceptions of the HSF Harakaze, the Akazuki, and the Kitakaze that precede it. This thing is all about the Daka. Despite the fact that it's only armed with 100mm guns, which normally would have a hard time with high explosive shells struggling to penetrate the armor plating of a Tier 8 destroyer, Wargaming gave it an artificial penetration buff, which by itself gives the Harugamo 30mm of high explosive penetration with its 100mm shells, enough to give Tier 8, 9 and 10 cruisers an extremely bad day. But if you stick a captain on it who also has the IFHE skill, you get 37mm of penetration, which means that these tiny little pop guns can also seriously ruin the day of any Tier 8, 9 or 10 battleship captain. Originally it was anticipated that the sheer number, because it has 10 of them, and rate of fire, because they fire every 3 seconds, of these 100mm guns would be enough to offset any difficulties caused by low high explosive shell penetration. But when that proved not to be the case, and the guns had their penetration buffed, obviously the rate of fire was nerfed. Oh wait, no it wasn't, was it? <laughs> These guns still only take three seconds to reload, and it's got ten of them, and they can penetrate 37mm of armor with high explosive shells. So, yeah. There are some downsides, of course. It only has one torpedo launcher, with five tubes, but it also has a torpedo reload booster. And it's not particularly quick, not by destroyer standards anyway, with a top speed of just over 35 knots, but... Well, it's not particularly slow either, and it's not amazingly stealthy, although it's, you know, it's it's certainly not as obvious as a Kleber or a Halland. But I think if those are all perfectly acceptable prices to pay to have 10 100mm guns that fire every 3 seconds and can penetrate 37mm of armour with high explosive. should probably also point out that if you do take the IFHE skill, and if you have this ship, and you have a 10-point captain, you are taking the IFHE skill. But if you do take the skill, then your fire chance is going to be reduced by 50%. But you're putting 10 shots out every 3 seconds. <laughs> so <laughs> You're going to set fires anyway. Now that poor old Moskva, who is the single biggest threat on the enemy team to Mauka Dragon, because he's the only radar, has got to be thinking to himself, well there's obviously, a oh look, there's a fire. Well, would you look at that? But he's obviously sitting there thinking to himself that there's there's definitely a Harugamo inside that very angry smoke screen over there. Do I move forward and light him up with radar or are I trying to get the hell out of here? But the decision is taken out of his hands because Mauka Dragon has been spotted anyway. Well, detected. I mean, it's not radar. It's Hydro, I believe, probably from the enemy Admiral Hipper. Yep, he's definitely in Hydro range. German Hydro? has very, very good range. So, that was a bit unwelcome. No use hiding in a smoke screen when you're spotted by Hydro. But at the moment, the Mosfa is the only thing that can fire at him anyway. Oh, hang on a second. British Tier 9 heavy cruiser, HMS Drake. I suppose it could have been his Hydro as well. I mean, it doesn't really matter. Manka Dragon is well and truly spotted. Question is, how brave is the Drake feeling? Well, I... I say brave, there's another word for what the Drake is about to do. It's not brave. 
<laughs> but I'm being polite here. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Yep, that just happened. And while that was happening, two further things occurred. First, the Moskva, fairly obviously, succumbed to the barrage of gunfire uh, that it was receiving. And also, the enemy Lexington managed to get a dive bomber kill on one of the friendly destroyers, the Erland. Now, I want you to remember that. And while Mauka Dragon is busy ripping this lightning a new one, pay attention to what the friendly carrier, HMS Implacable, is doing with his aircraft. Just in case you missed it, because there was quite a bit going on at the time, he was sending his rocket attack planes to attack this cluster of battleships and cruisers. Not here to spot and attack the Shimakaze, who's busy flipping Bravo, no, down here. Right into the single biggest concentration of enemy anti-aircraft firepower on the map, in order to attack a bunch of targets who've already flipped the cap anyway. So while Mauka Dragon is busy working on his third kill here, the enemy Monarch, I'm going to let slip a little sort of mini-spoiler, a sort of bijou spoilerette, because this battle is basically going to be decided by the actions of the carriers. Even though they're only Tier 8, this battle is going to be decided by what the enemy Lexington does and what the friendly Implacable doesn't do. So, Monarch's down, although Mauka Dragon didn't get the kill, there's a Lenin up ahead. Note that there is a friendly Aegir attempting to flip that central cap, and he is being spotted by the enemy Shimakaze. And the Shimakaze is going to remain undetected because the friendly carrier is thinking to himself, hmm, what's the single biggest source of anti-aircraft firepower on the enemy team? Oh yes, the Ohio. I'll go and attack that instead. Meanwhile, a bit of a brown alert moment here for uh, Mauka Dragon. Well, under normal circumstances, coming across an enemy heavy cruiser at this kind of range would be a brown alert moment for a destroyer, but I think it's the Hipper who's just gone to brown alert. Didn't use his Hydro either, despite the fact that Mauka was in range and inside a smokescreen. The reason for that is because the Hipper was getting his torpedoes away instead, and actually, you know what, That's that was a pretty good choice, because it's a very, very narrow channel. Fill it with torpedoes, you're bound to hit something. Unfortunately, his decision to turn away at the last second means that his guns are now all pointing the wrong way and there's no way he's going to survive long enough to get the torpedoes away from the other side. And check this out, kids. History in the making. Yoshino doing a drive-by on a battleship and not getting themselves killed in the process. Remember where you were years from now when your grandchildren want to know what you were doing when that happened. So, while Mauka Dragon is repositioning, I want you to pay attention to a couple of things. The team have just lost their fourth ship but they have managed to sink six of the enemy. And while the enemy controlled two of the caps to our team's one, the A-gear, without any help from anybody, has just managed to flip the central cap. So two caps and two kills up. So what's the implacable doing with his aircraft? Because right now, if I was that implacable, a tier eight carrier in a tier 10 battle, I'd be using my dive bombers to find. And even if I can't kill the enemy Shimakaze, I can at least spot him to give the A-Gear a fighting chance. And of course, the Implacable hasn't bothered doing any of that, so the A-Gear has been sunk by the undetected Shimakaze. The undetected Shimakaze, which is about to start flipping that central cap straight back. What was the Implacable doing with his aircraft? Well, he sent his Tier 8 aircraft, not just once, but twice, against a Tier 10 American battleship instead. Just to put this into context for you, let me just read you a couple of lines from the Implacable's wiki entry. Attack aircraft are extremely effective against destroyers. Bombers have low penetration, making them extremely reliant on fires when attacking battleships. Meanwhile, what's the Lexington doing? The enemy carrier. Oh yeah. Here he comes. You see the difference here? I mean, I don't have to draw you a picture, do I? I mean, luckily for Mauka Dragon, the Harugamo's AA is not bad, and these are just, you know, tier 8 carrier aircraft and there's a Yoshino with them. But it's it's not the damage that the aircraft do, it's the fact that they spot you. That's what gets destroyers killed. A fact that seems to be completely eluding the Implacable, who actually flew his aircraft right past the cap circle without bothering to even attempt to detect the Shimakaze, still undetected, who just flipped the central cap and continues to waste his aircraft on the targets that he's going to do the least amount of damage to and which are going to do 
the most amount of damage to his aircraft. And here comes the Lexington again. You see the difference? I mean, it's not hard, is it? Now, you might be sitting there thinking, yeah, let's not get carried away, Jingles. These are just tier 8 carriers, and it is a tier 10 battle. I mean, exactly how much impact, or lack of impact, can they have? Well, you just wait until the end of the battle, and then you ask me that question again. Now, those were the Shimakaze's torpedoes. And based purely on the fact that even a broken clock tells the right time twice a day, the Implacable has just spotted the Shimakaze, completely by accident, because he was going for the Ohio and the Yamato. And even though he's just spotted a Shimakaze, he's still going for the Ohio and the Yamato. <sighs> and losing all of his aircraft in the process. Meanwhile, here comes the Lexington again. It's like night and day, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Well, it's, again, it's not the threat of torpedoes from the Lexington, it's the fact that you're being spotted, so Mauka Dragon is forced to use his smokescreen and starts farming damage on the Ohio over there. Mauka Dragon keeping an eye on the Sexy Lexi's aircraft in case they try to flush him out of the smokescreen with torpedoes, and they have. They absolutely have. Well, they've tried. It's only a three-spread drop, so he is able to avoid them. But you see the difference here between a carrier that's capable of thinking and breathing at the same time and one that isn't. Again, you might be asking yourself just how much of a difference exactly is it going to make? Well, remember all of the chances that the Implacable had if not to kill the Shimakaze, although he might have because his rocket attack planes are particularly effective against destroyers, but he would have spotted the Shimakaze if he'd even bothered to try and potentially at least the A-gear might have killed him. But he didn't do any of that. He's thrown his aircraft away against the likes of those two. Meanwhile, the Lexington, doing his best to at least attempt to spot, if not focus and kill, the surviving enemy destroyer. Like Night and Day, like Chalk and Cheese, like Ebony and Ivory. And unfortunately, this is where things start to go very, very wrong. A whole bunch of friendlies have just been sunk in rapid succession. There are only four of them left alive. Although Mauka Dragon did finish off uh, the Ohio. And he's collected a Confederate award to go with his two devastating strikes. The problem right now, of course, is, well, not just the fact that he's constantly being harassed by the Lexington's aircraft. And here they come again. But if he wants to do anything about that cap circle, they're going to have to kill the Yamato first. And it shouldn't be too difficult to kill the Yamato, it's just going to take some time. And let's just hope that he's left to his own devices while he's doing it, and the Yamato has more important things to shoot at. No, somebody is targeting him. Prop, is it the... No, it's not the Yamato. Hmm. Well, whoever's targeting him isn't shooting at him. Although the... It could be that the Shimakaze is launching torpedoes at him, but as long as nobody's actually shooting at you, make hay while the sun shines. So he's continuing to rain down high explosive on the Yamato. It looks like all of those torpedoes are going to miss, but I don't think he actually meets the torpedoes. The Yamato is about to go down. And that is going to be Mountain Dragon's fifth kill, Kraken Unleashed. And as you can tell by the red tracer, he has uh, Yamamoto Isoroku as his captain. And you know what happens when you get the uh, fifth kill and you have Yamamoto Isoroku as your captain. You get the second wind skill. And what that does... There we go. So the already terrifying rate of fire of the Hirugamo, not even taking into account something like the Adrenaline Rush skill which boosts your uh, rate of fire depending on how much health you have remaining. But when you, the second wind skill activates, as well as giving you an emergency heal, which is very, very useful under the circumstances, it also buffs your rate of fire by something like 32%. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just look at this. <laughs> Remember, these guns were already firing once every three seconds, and there are ten of them. And now, uh, once every two seconds? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think the Lexington's going to survive this. 
Normally, going after a carrier in a destroyer is fairly suicidal. This time, however, yeah, I think he's going to be okay. Oh, speaking of which, do you remember that Shimakaze that the friendly Implacable has completely ignored this entire game? Uh, which directly led to the enemy team being so far ahead on points? Well, while Mountain Dragon is busy incinerating this Lexington, I just want to draw your attention to the top uh, right-hand corner of the map. Mm-hmm. You see what happens, Mr. Implacable, when you ignore Mr. Shimakaze? Well, you can't ignore him now. He's 1.2 kilometers away from you. <laughs> and like I said, normally when a destroyer goes after a carrier, it's generally suicide for the destroyer. You know, unless unless the carrier's that implacable. In which case, you know, why not? Hell, close in and pelt him with rotten fruit and vegetables. You'll probably be completely safe. Okay, so we're getting down to the vinegar strokes here. The Takao is down, bitch slapped by the North Carolina, good shooting. Frederick the Great next. We're going to lose the implacable. In fact, we have just lost the implacable, sure enough. Not torpedoed, by the way, in the ultimate humiliation, gunned down by a Shimakaze. But quite frankly, that implacable was no use to the team alive. Now, high-tier German battleships like the Bismarck, like the Frederick the Great there, like the Grosse Kurfers, tend to be secondary spec. But even if this guy was full secondary spec, and I don't think he is, it's not going to be enough when a Harugamo was unloading on you like this, as well as a North Carolina and a Yoshino. So the Frederick the Great, is, is, he's done. He's not surviving this. It's just a question of who gets the kill. And it is, in fact, American Dragon. That's kill number seven, by the way. 272,000 damage. There's just one slight problem. One bijou problemet. One tiny little fly in the ointment, if you will. The last surviving enemy ship is that Shimakaze. Now anybody who was thinking earlier just exactly how much of an influence can a tier 8 carrier actually have in a tier 10 battle anyway? Remind yourself, who was it who failed to spot that Shimakaze multiple times when they had the chance? In fact, who was the only ship on this team, since they had no radar, who was in a position to spot that Shimakaze at will while the Shimakaze was advertising where he was by flipping a cap, not once but twice, and then torpedoing the Agir. Who was it who did actually completely accidentally spot the Shimakaze with dive bombers and then throw those dive bombers against the Tier 10 battleship instead? And we could kind of use some aircraft around about now because nobody has radar. The Shimakaze is faster than anything left alive in this battle. And it's got better stealth than anything left alive in this battle. And while we know where the Shimakaze is, he's flipping the cap circle up there in the northeast. He's not going to be there for much longer, and you've got no chance of catching him. So all that Shimakaze has to do to win is nothing stupid like trying to get another kill. In fact, Mauka Dragon is probably praying that the Shimakaze is going to come out and try to get another kill. Because then he's got a chance of catching him and killing him. But if the Shimakaze has any sense, he's just going to dump some torpedoes in the water behind him and run and run and run. And I thought for a second earlier that the North Carolina was actually throwing the game because he was heading south to flip the uh, cap in the southwest. But the North Carolina realised before I did that it wouldn't make any difference. There isn't enough time left in the battle and the enemy team are too far ahead on points. So he's turned around and he's also heading northeast in an attempt to find and catch this elusive Shimakaze, but of course there's no way that is ever going to happen. I mean, Mauka Dragon is obviously sitting here waiting to see if he gets spotted. That might give him some idea of where the Shimakaze ran away to, but the Shimmer's too smart to even allow him that much. He doesn't want to be spotted, obviously, but he's also smart enough to know that he doesn't want to spot anything, because the very act of spotting a target can, while it doesn't completely give your position away. It gives the person who's been spotted some idea based on the breaks in the terrain, the gaps between the islands of where he might have been spotted from. And the Shimakaze's not even giving him that much. 272,000 damage. 
seven kills, multiple devastating strikes, Confederate, high caliber, Kraken unleashed. And it's just not enough when your team's lumbered with a carrier like that, who quite frankly was no use whatsoever to the team alive. You might be sitting there thinking, well, you can't blame it all on the carrier, Jingles. I mean, you know, there's another 11 players on the team. And yeah, that's true. I mean, there were some standout players on both teams. Mauka Dragon here, and of course the enemy Shimakaze player. But why was the enemy Shimakaze player the standout player on the enemy team? Well, of course, you have to give credit where credit's due. He did play very, very well. But at the same time, whereas Mauka Dragon was playing against an enemy team that had an aircraft carrier and one radar, the Shimakaze, by contrast, was playing against an enemy team that didn't have any radar and definitely didn't have a carrier, at least not as far as he was concerned. So while I did say at the beginning of the video that the matchmaking was pretty good for Mauka Dragon's Hirugamo, the matchmaking couldn't have been any better for the Shimakaze. No radars, no carriers. That is Shimakaze heaven. It does not get any better than that for a Shimakaze. And that you can lay squarely at the feet of the friendly implacable. Mauka Dragon, my commiserations, you really didn't deserve to lose that one. Although then again, neither did the Shimakaze. So I'm kind of conflicted. <laughs> Still, um, thank you very much for sending that one in. Everyone else, I hope you enjoyed it. And as always, take care. Stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.